Uh, so we're going to talk about three different topics in this area, and uh, the first one we'll talk about will be phase reversal, <coughs> which is really useful to identify the central sulcus, and that's a big problem for neurosurgeons when they're uh, doing tumor resection. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, mapping of speech areas with direct cortical stimulation and mapping of motor areas with uh, direct cortical stimulation. So uh, we're going to start with the phase reversal. So the goals of, of uh, cortical mapping, and remember early on we, I said there's really two things. There's mapping and there's monitoring. Mapping is a little different than monitoring. The goal is to localize the central sulcus identify the cortical motor areas and subcortical motor tracts if possible, and identify the cortical language areas and subcortical language tracts. And so this is the uh, central sulcus here, here's the somesthetic area, here's primary motor cortex. And as we dig through this material, we'll start to pull in other parts of the cortex. But the goal of the phase reversal is to recognize where the central sulcus is. And um, people that look at the brain, you know, you think, oh, you should be able to recognize just looking at it where the central <laughs> sulcus is, but it's actually quite hard uh, to visually identify it. And so this kind of information is very helpful. Um, identifying the central sulcus, so preoperative in imaging studies provides hints uh, but it doesn't provide the, the definitive information. Uh, cortical mapping also helps to identify the central surface. But phase reversal, <laughs> along with direct cortical stimulation, is really the two things put together really are, are pretty definitive. And I know we've looked at, at many films over the years where we thought central surface was at one place and it was actually the gyrus back or a gyrus ahead of where you thought it was. So um, you can't rely just on the imaging. Um, so the core idea of, of, let me take a step back before I get into the core idea. We always only use median nerve potentials for phase reversal. So I've seen people try to use the lower extremities, posterior tibial, but you don't have a good NP complex, and you really want to have both the NP complex, and you all you have that very well uh, with the, the median nerve potential. So, what I'm going to talk about is phase reversal using median nerve potentials as as the response of choice. Uh, so we talked about you know here's our our stereotypic response: the N wave, the P wave. These are the, the far field responses. Uh, and the, the method is based on the fact that the dipole, uh, uh, which is, is developed by these, when we talked about the idea that you've got these pyramidal neurons in the cortical mantle, they're produce, producing a dipole, and these dipoles then produce the signals that we're seeing. Uh, and the, and it's been established that these dipoles invert from the postcentral cortex to the precentral cortex. So uh, an N20 dipole will look like this postcentral, so the sensory area, and it will look like this peak uh, precentral. And I don't know how many people have ever done a mapping study. We wanted to do that as a practicum, but you know, obviously we didn't get to do it for median nerves, so where you record um, the median nerve potentials over the entire head. Say you stimulate the, the left median nerve and you record not only where it's going to be best, but you record, you know, uh, P4 to a contralateral mastoid, you re record seven or eight locations on the head, and you can look at the distribution of these fields you know, rather than the way we look at it, you look at what's happening across the entire head. And there's activity occurring over the entire head. And so when you do that and you look at what's happening uh, post-centrally, you see the, the N and the P wave. It has a slightly different shape because 
what we're used to seeing against you know against a, a reference site. Uh, <coughs> reference site. It looks different than it does. And you do that for the frontal part, and it's got an inverted wave. Okay. And and you can find parts in the front that look similar to what's in the posterior, but it, the whole thing is very complex, and it's kind of really interesting to look at. If you haven't done this, I recommend that when you go home, do it. You know, get like ten different electrodes. It doesn't matter where you put them. Record it against an, an indifferent site, and you can you can actually. <coughs> Uh, you can do it computationally or you can do it on paper if you want to. You can take these things from the different parts of the brain and you can add them together and get the response that you see when you do the differential recording. So, I mean, it's very physical. It just is exactly the way you think it ought to be. And that's how people discovered uh, this, this reversal. And we first saw it actually in the early 70s and we wrote some papers about mapping this stuff. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, so we've talked about the N20P30 complex, um, and we're going to record a P20 N30 from the precentral gyrus. So a lot of this stuff, it just builds on what we've been talking about. You know. uh, so uh, there's a bunch of things in this slide. We'll just focus on uh, this figure here and this figure here. Uh, and we'll, we'll make this clear as we go along. So this was a mapping study we did, and um, we thought this here was the central sulcus. And you can see we were doing, we like to use these four contact uh, grids, and I think Sasha showed, brought one over and showed people what it looked like if they hadn't seen it. Uh, and so we typically will look at or four responses. These were different tracks where the, where the grid was placed in different locations. And you can see for the post-central ones, this is now recorded against the contralateral in different reference sites. So instead of uh, uh, P4 to P to C4, it's P4 to contralateral master. But you see the you see exactly the same thing. There's the N wave, N waves. Okay. And you can see this. So this kind of represents where that was with respect to the sulcus. Now, if you look at this one here, here's N20, and then the the uh, this was the craniotomy here, and the electrode's been slid under the craniotomy. And you can see there's an inversion from here to here. And so this was determined to be where the central sulcus was because that inver inversion existed. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a couple of really important things when you think about this. One is you really want to be sure you're seeing an inversion. Sometimes uh, if you don't have a good contact on the cortex with these grids, you're going to get very noisy mm -hmm. signals. So um, the cortex has to be uh, damp. Uh, it can't be, you really don't want it dried out. You want it to be, uh, have saline on it. Uh, you uh, have to have that good contact. And then you got to realize that the central sulcus is not a straight line. You know, it's a curved, uh, architecture. And so uh, as you map this thing out, you, you may get an inversion at some point here and then at some other point the inversion may, may occur somewhere else. And, and you've got to do enough of these to get a picture in your mind of how is that sulcus curving. I mean, you, you, you can usually you're fine with one point because you're, you're uh, you know, you just want to identify the sulcus, but sometimes you want to know where it actually is going, and you, and you uh, want to do several of these tracks, and you've got to somehow map in your mind where these where these changes are occurring. So these are just the kind of strip electrodes put on the brain. Uh, that's the key point: is looking for that inversion. 
testing it multiple times, uh, usually it's pretty clear, but it can be obscured by noise. So you got to be patient. The other thing we do, which I ought to mention, is you know, we've always got the median nerve potentials uh, from the scalp before we do the phase reversal. And so that helps you, you know, you know what the N20 latency is in that particular patient. You know what the P wave latency is in that particular patient. And then the, the latencies at the cortex will be about the same. They won't be identical, they're, they're about the same. Uh, but they may, they may differ by a millisecond or two. And we think that's, for the post, for the postcentral gyrus, we think that's more the filtering effects of, the, of all the tissue that's between the cortex and the, and the, and the scalp. You know, we talked about, you've got all this stuff that is filtering the data. So there's usually about a millisecond difference. Um, on the, comparing the, the inverted response, so the response on this side, there's always a couple of milliseconds difference. So what was an N20 pre-sulcus is a P20 post-sulcus, but it may be 21 milliseconds uh, pre-sulcus and maybe 23 milliseconds post-sulcus. Now, we, I think that's, you know, we were talking about how these fibers project. They just don't project up to uh, uh, sensory area. They, they, they actually project all over the cortex. In fact, there's some that project anteriorly, there's some that project ipsilateral, there's some, you know, project contralateral anterior. So the, the projections are actually more complicated. So you shouldn't be surprised if you see a very small latency difference between homologous waves. And it just uh, doesn't surprise me. Uh, so what we're interested in is, of course, in identifying where the central sulcus is. So just crossing the central sulcus is the key point. And we tend to use, you know, four electrodes, four, four contact points. Again, trying to keep it to where you can conceptually think about what you're looking at. You know, you want to be able to have it physically in your mind. So you can see here, this is our N20, 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 and it's inverted. So we know that between the physical point where this contact is and the physical point where this contact is, that's where the central sulcus is. You know? and, and that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Again, you can look at, at our uh, parameters here. In this case, we average for these. We average the same, 128. The stimulus frequency is a little different. It's a little higher, 3.43 hertz, because we're, we're uh, not doing multimodality things. We're only looking at one thing. Uh, but we keep the same observation at 200. So this is still 200 milliseconds from here to here. Now, a lot of people use shorter observation intervals. I like to use that because uh, you can play with this on your equipment at home and you'll see um, the, there's an aspect ratio, there's a way you see the data. And I found that for me, if I use this kind of uh, width for the data, it, it makes a wave that I can, a set of waves that I can easily identify. Okay, so if you if you make it too spread out, namely you make the observation interval too small, it spreads these things out and they lose detail. So it's harder to recognize what's going on. So I, I recommend that you use exactly the same observation interval for the phase reversal that you're used to using for the scalp responses. Because it makes it easier for you to, to, to interpret it. If, if that you know makes physical sense, then there's other things you've got to worry about, um, and the question always comes up: no phase reversal. Is it pre or post sulcus? Um, so this is a big a big question because uh, you you don't know. In many cases, you you just don't know where the sulcus is, and you want to identify it. 
but you don't know if you're totally pre-sulcus or totally post-sulcus. So that's one of the questions you've got to try to, to uh, sort out. And so uh, this is a situation in which you're all motor cortex, and this is our little four contact grid. All sensory cortex, this is our little four contact grid. So in that situation, you won't, either of those situations, you won't see any phase reversal. Okay, so, uh, and you can see here, uh, this is an N20, that's actually a P30 at 29.3 milliseconds. So what is it? You can see it. And this is just moving that thing along different tracks. So in this particular case, we decided this went with this because it was P30 and there were no changes. But that's the kind of where the decision can get hard. It's not if you go across the central sulcus, it's where are you if you're not across the central sulcus. And, and many of these distorted, uh, many of these operations where the cortex is distorted, it's hard to to pull out to make that decision. So that that's the kind of thing you got to wrestle with. So here's another example: sensory cortex, and just crossing the central sulcus. So here we go. This is pure sensory cortex. Okay, so the, the little four terminal grid is here, and you can see these responses right here. There's an N20. This wave, wave by the way, is real. Uh, you see that little thing there? That's called P16. And that actually is a thalamic wave where the N20 is considered to be thalamal cortical. So you can see N20, N20, N20 something's starting to change. I'll show you what we get here. N20, 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 N20. So that's all somewhere in the somatosensory cortex. So the grid is slid forward. Same kind of thing. Here's our somesthetic cortex. Here's the motor cortex. This data refers to that. Again, this, this is over the somesthetic area. N20, N20, and then you start to see phase reversal come in. And so this contact, which is this very frontal contact, is directly over the motor cortex. This contact is probably right at the central sulcus, and this contact is sensory cortex. So this is a game you got to play. You can't make one, one recording and think you're going to answer the question. Uh, you may have to do 10 or 15 of these traces, of these sets of recordings, before you convince yourself you've correctly identified uh, where that, that uh, crossing is. Again, same kind of thing. Uh, so this is just another example. Pre-sulcus and across the sulcus. So, motor cortex, we were anterior to, and actually, I, I don't like to use the words, let me just step back and make a comment. I don't like to say motor cortex and sensory cortex. I like to say anterior to the central sulcus and posterior to the central sulcus. Uh, it's, a, it's a subtle difference in meaning, but it's important in terms of, of uh, understanding what structures you may get into. Because you don't know when you start out how far anterior you actually are. And because you're, you don't see a phase reversal, it doesn't mean you're, you're sitting in primary motor cortex. You'd be sitting anterior to that. So uh, I, 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 when I talk to the surgeons about it, I use that nomenclature. So that I think it's a clearer expression of what we're actually doing. So again, four contacts, and you can see there's a uh, large going positive wave. Uh, now, this thing uh, is, pos is positioned more, more posteriorly. Still, uh, you can start to see there's reversal occurring. So 
Uh, I guess the, the take home message is you start somewhere, everything looks the same, and then you've got to move it either forward or backward depending on where you are and then go for the inversion. So don't don't think you're gonna put it down, get an answer, and go home. You gotta you gotta play with it. Uh, again, we, we tend to do things the same way. So 128 stimuli. These tend to be big responses. This, this is scaled at 20 microvolts per division. So direct cortical recording is a big thing. Uh, but we do the same number of stimuli to get rid of noise. You know, we want to get rid of all the noise we can. Uh, okay, is it, are there any questions about phaser groups? So I know some people were interested in it. Uh, and, and certainly, any questions you have, please ask them because the, the discussion has been really helpful to me. So, uh, we're going to go on on the theme of mapping now uh, about cortical stimulation, uh, applying electrical current directly on the cortex to produce transient activation disruption. So, that's the idea. Wake patients. You do for language mapping and then anesthetized patients, motor area mapping uh, by again direct cortical stimulation recording these compound muscle potentials. Uh, uh, again, I apologize. Uh, the um, these images aren't project projecting well, yeah, but they were just to make the general comments that. These imaging tools, the image guidance, and the tractography are extremely important to think about what's happening with the patient and the plan, what you're going to do. And obviously, the people that do this know this. This is, a, you can make that out, that was a tumor in this patient, which was near uh, Wernicke's area. And there's a, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's one track which goes like this, and there's another track which goes like this. And One's the visual pathways and one is the auditory uh, arcular fibers that project between the monkeys and focus area. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> there are oleptogenic concerns when you do direct cortical stimulation. So, you, you do worry about producing seizure activity. Uh, and, in particular, with the patients that have had. A history of seizures, so you got to be prepared for that. Um, some of this is obvious, can jeopardize, jeopardize the patient's safety. Uh, nothing like seeing a patient go into a seizure when they're in head bins and they're uh, kind of awake and uh, you know, it, it quickly <laughs> makes you appreciate the, the risks. Um, and it can interfere with the mapping results if they can't continue to, to cooperate. Uh, so if a patient's got a history of generalized tonic-clonic seizures, uh, um, these have a higher tendency to respond when you stimulate, so you got to be careful. And all, all the patients get loaded with some kind of anti-epileptic drug to recover. <coughs> Go to surgery. Ice-cold saline should be available intraoperatively for prompt irrigation of the cortex. That's the best thing there is to de to uh, stop seizure activity rapidly, you squirt it on the cortex, and it's like instantaneously seizures stop far far quicker than any of the any of the drugs can uh, can act. Uh, this is the way, this this is a, a a good math. This is the way I think about the language and mapping problem. And again, this is in your handout. This table is really helpful, too. Um, you know, we normally think about, when we're doing language mapping, we're normally thinking about Wernicke's area, Broca's area, and the arcuate fibers that project um, to that. But that's really a, uh, not the best way, I think, to think about what you're trying to do when you're doing language mapping. And this figure I, I like because it really captures 
how all the different centers or the different major areas of the brain fit together. And so, uh, you know, you have uh, auditory input, which comes up into Heschel's gyrus, which then projects to Warnke's area, uh, then projects to association cortex, where it really gets a lot of its contextual meaning. The contextual meaning doesn't actually get developed in Warnke's area. At the same time, you have visual input flowing in, which goes from primary visual cortex to secondary visual cortex, and then into this associatory association area, which then projects back down to Warnke's area, and then anteriorly to Broca's area in the operculum. So, uh, but Broca's area isn't primary motor cortex. So it projects the primary motor cortex to actually develop the words you're going to say, and then the supplemental motor cortex is also involved. So Broca's area projects to, to SMA, and then SMA also projects down to primary motor cortex. And I'm not going to go through this table. It's in your, it's in the, the, the handout you got, but it's very helpful because when you think about, it, you know, if you know you have a patient that's in this area here. You're going to focus on those things in, in the weight language testing, which really are driven by motor uh, perceptions. But if you have a tumor in this area, the problem becomes anywhere in here becomes a lot more complex. So um, you want to be able to test this inflow, you want to be able to test this inflow, and you want to be able to test how well they. Um, can do all the functions that are encapsulated in that area. And in the operating room, you can't spend a lot of time to do, you know, a formal <coughs> regime of testing. Typically, you know, in most of the cases we're involved in, the surgeons would like to spend no more than half an hour doing the mapping. Uh, many times, as I'll, I'll talk about, we keep the patients awake for the whole tumor resection and we'll continue to talk with them. So, this is a mapping function, um, trying to probe those areas. We do a preoperative evaluation, uh, and, and we do it in two parts. One is a baseline verbal function evaluation, and I do this. It's, a, it's, it's informal in the sense that I go meet with the patient, I evaluate them, I talk to them, I find out do they know where they are, do they know what day of the week it is, do they have an idea what time it is. In current events, so are they oriented to date, place, time, and current events? Do they know what the operation is about? Are they are they aware that they're going to have a white craniotomy, and that during the operation they're going to be uh, talking with someone, and they're going to be hearing a lot of people talking around them? So, um, and and I explore with them what the details are, and then I look for their verbal fluency. Can they articulate? Not, not so much the motor part of articulation, but can they form their ideas fluently? Do they have a, the ability to communicate clearly? Uh, word generation. Can they generate words? Uh, I was talking to a woman the other day. She had a word finding problem, and every third word was the word bay. Uh, I've got, I'm going bay, and tomorrow I will bay. And, and, you know, it was really interesting. She could. She could she could clearly communicate, but she couldn't find the words she was looking for. Visual object name, this goes back to the whole issue of part of the speech area is the visual input of the things people are going to name. So we, we do very simple things. We have, and we bring a picture of them, unfortunately, but we use a set, of, a set of cards that are good for people, kids that are three to five years of age, and they have a picture of a duck or a dog or a bird, and they have a word, duck, dog, or bird. You can show them the picture without the word. You can show them the, the word without the picture. Uh, and you can test whether or not they can recognize the stuff and they can say it. Reading of simple words, a visual object. But see the duck, can you read the word duck? And then simple arithmetic, can they? Which one, <coughs> one is it? Two, two and two is four. Three and three is six, so forth. If you ask them to multiply 600 by 600, people can't do it. 
but if you ask them to multiply six by six, they can do it. So the idea here is not to, to uh, you know, precisely define them in a very precise way. It's to get an understanding so that while their brain is being stimulated, you can repeatedly test them. Uh, you find out how they could pronounce complex words. So I don't know in Russia what Russia would have. Complex word would be all the words are complex to me, but you know in, in Pennsylvania I'll say can you say Pittsburgh? Can you say Massachusetts? That's hard for people to say. Can you say Pittsburgh? Can you say things like that. So simple things you can code rapidly. And sure. Uh, Well, what, what we do is we first of all do find out what their native language is because that's extremely <coughs> important. So like we did a patient three weeks ago, his native language, he was originally from India, and his, his native language was a dialect called, if I remember right, uh, Tangit, I think Tangit. And it turns out it's from the eastern coast of India above the area of Madras. And so uh, we couldn't find the translator in the time we had because we only had like a day and a half. So we tested, we tested him in English, and and we did that during the surgery. And his English function was well preserved, okay? but his function in his native language was partially lost. Now, that, this was uh, three weeks ago that his, his opera week, operation was done. And the surgeon that did it told me before I left that his native language was starting to come back. But that's an extremely important point. Uh, you know, you've got to think about at least the native language and the primary language. I mean, some people are really multilingual. You can't do it all. But we use the same test structure. What I would have done differently with him if we'd had the time, I would have. I'm sure there's somebody I could have found that could have spoke that dialect. Um, but the hospital didn't have anybody in their registry that did. So, you know, someone that you could say, come to the opera room with me and do this. Because uh, there's no other way around it. You know, you've got to probe that if it's the reality. So that's a very real point. There are a lot of papers where uh, sent, sent uh, they were uh, functional MRI in multi language operations. They have different area of activation when they are speaking different language. It's a very, very specific issue. Yeah. And uh, so all scientists are interested in this uh, problem. Yeah. It's a real, it's a real it's interesting a issue. Next, and uh, yeah. for example, they, 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 in the article there were some MRI images and uh, F functional MRI, and they, for example, it speaks about uh, uh, we can see activated one area, and then when he speaks English, another area, and then so on. Yeah, but if, we discuss, if you discuss with the MRI specialists, they sometimes uh, didn't know what uh, this uh, sports uh, means. Yeah. It's very often. Yeah, it's very often, you know. Yeah, functional MRI is a yeah, different because it depends uh, on how they uh, turn the uh, um, uh, trigger of settings. Setting, 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 yeah. yeah, and they're they're looking for such small differences in blood flow that you wonder how good the statistics are that they're using. Yeah, I think it's, it's only study statistics. Yeah, and uh, uh, they have a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we uh, saw it on uh, Polyanov's uh, readings, uh, so on the other conference with the fMRI of uh, frozen fish. Yeah. Uh, with the, 
bright uh, spo uh, spots in, in the f fish's brain. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah, it is. So you know what we know. The reality of what we know is that there is an issue. Uh, and for our purposes, how do you <coughs> protect the patient? And I think the idea is you try to get someone, uh, you know, to to be able to participate in the testing in the native language also. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a big enough experience with non-native speaking English people or non-primary English people to know how big the problem is, but I know it's a problem, just in, in several patients over the years. So we try to keep it simple. Um, uh, just let me make another, one more comment about the preoperative evaluation. I don't know if, if it's possible to do this here or not, but we do get a very formal language assessment by the neuropsychologists. Mm -hmm. So, and we get that preoperatively, and then we get it at six months. So we can get a very uh, formal comparison of how well the speech preservation went. Yeah. And we wait six months because we want all the swelling and edema and everything to have gone down and the brain to be, to be happy. Again, I have one question yeah. for you. Sure, no, of course. Uh, we have discussed uh, from specialists from uh, Budenko Institute uh, because they use um, uh, monopyral stimulation yeah. and uh, they use only six or eight million pairs. Um, he tried to make of speech uh -huh. at first, uh, but we tried to use uh, till 20 yeah. million pairs. And uh, they told me that um, it's not necessary because it's not the change of results. But I think it's not true. Yeah, I, I, let me tell you what we do. Uh, you can use either monopolar or bipolar. Uh, if you look at the Ogeman papers, they used all bipolar stimulation. We use monopolar stimulation, and there's a lot of small papers out there, and when you put them all together, it looks to me like monopolar stimulation is actually more effective than bipolar. Um, we start, what we do is we put the cortical strip down, okay, to look for after discharge. And then before we start the language testing, we want to see if we can force the patient into after discharge. So we will go up to 20 milliamps, okay. So we'll start at 1 milliamp and we'll go up 1 milliamp, 5, 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20. If we get to 20 milliamps and we are not producing any after discharge, we will stay at 20 milliamps. And then if we localize a speech area, we will come down from mm -hmm. that. So I think that's probably what you do at that, something similar. Uh, and so <coughs> I said increment by one, but I, but I really meant this more stuff. We stop if there's an after discharge. If, if an AD occurs, we uh, surgeons squirt the cold saline, and we decrease the intensity by 20 cent percent. So if we're at 20 milliamps, we'll come down to 15 or 16 milliamps. Uh, and usually you're fine there, and you can work everywhere. And and then if we find a very, very precise speech areas, we'll come down a little more, find out where we can maintain that disruption and then we'll map more at that intensity. So, but we have no problem. I don't like to go higher than 20 milliamps. I feel it's a, it's a good thing. And I have a question. And how far you put the stimulator nearby, uh, near the um, grid, street? street. Uh, the station grid. The, 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 the grid for the looking for the corticog. After discharge. What is the distance between the stimulator yeah. and the registrator uh, electrodes? Okay. <laughs> Probably a, a, about a centimeter is the minimum distance. Okay, and then usually you work from about a centimeter away. So it's very close to the field where you're stimulating. And, and from, the, from the purposes of what we're doing, uh, there's, there's no, you know, you have the electrical artifact when you're stimulating, but then you have a period where you're not stimulating, and that's the part you know, where you're looking for the after discharge. And so there's really no electrical interference from stimulating the knot. So you, we typically are about a centimeter at the minimum distance and then we'll work away from there. But if the patient starts to seize, 
it doesn't matter if you're five centimeters away or six centimeters away from where you're stimulating with the grid, you're still going to see the seizure. You know, it's not, this doesn't stay focal, it spreads. And it spreads pretty, you know, pretty robustly. And is there any difference between the lobe, uh, temporal or um, frontal lobe, where you're testing this after discharges? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There, there is a difference between uh, patients, say, that have temporal lobe epilepsy, epilepsy and patients that have generalized seizures. So the generalized seizures probably involve the frontal lobe. There is a difference in those patients. I've never tried to figure out if there's a, a, a difference in the, in, from the lobes themselves. So you put in any place where you see this, uh, the cortex? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Now what will be, you know, you'll, you'll stimulate where the, in the areas where the, of course, where the tumor is and where you, because that's what you're trying to decide is, is the is, are the eloquent areas in the region of the tumor. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, we try to judge it appropriately. So this was an example of after discharge from uh, <coughs> a weight patient. We got, you know, the direct cortical stimulation recording the EG from the cortex. It's a warning to us, close to inducing seizures. So you can see this is what after discharge looked like in this patient, they scored it in a cold saline and it went away. And, and that's pretty much what it looks like. Um, there's no problem with continuing to test if a patient um, gets an after discharge, we just decrease the intensity, like I say, by about 20% to keep going. If you use the parameter of or or Probably we're closer to Penfield. Okay. So because simulation. I know that the Penfield simulation is more often to uh, propagation. Uh, Cause this out of this Yeah. yeah so you know that uh, Penfield simulation uh, more often produce uh, uh, seizures and uh, and uh, yeah. after discharge. Well, it's monopolar. Uh, you know, we're stimulating a, a reasonably robust frequency. Uh, you know, so it's more in the direction of what Penfield does. Monopolar. Yeah, monopolar. Yeah. It's because I read the Penfield paper so many years ago that I, I thought he was the god. So I, <laughs> uh, um, so. Uh, again, just some after discharge, but what you're looking for is interruption of baseline verbal function. And uh, so we test all these things I talked about, and then remember to look for after discharges. Uh, I, I don't know how you do the testing, if it's that same idea, probably pretty much. I don't have a specific test now, because we have a neurolinguistic laboratory. Uh -huh. And usually they come to our operation yeah. and show from uh, no, 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 laptop. No, 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 no. Oh, laptop, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a standardized set of things we do. Uh, yeah, but we do repeat, 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 repeat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and uh, the other thing that we'll do is probably about half the patients are kept awake for the entire recession. Uh, and so we're continually testing. We might be over several hours. And we use only awake, we're not sleeping patient, mm -hmm. and we talk uh, this patient to patient Through the entire, yeah. We'll, we'll do, like I say, about half. We'll keep awake the entire, <coughs> the entire time, and the other half will be put back to sleep. Uh, and, and it really depends on how uh, complicated the distribution of areas are that are sensitive to stimulation. Uh, again, this is just reiterates what we talked about, um, trying to come up with a simple, consistent, repeatable way of probing this stuff. Um,
That's me, if you can make it out. That's me under the drapes right there talking to the patient. And, uh, the patients get to know me quite well over several hours. <laughs> we had a, a nurse we did a, a few weeks ago who, uh, she was the best patient you could ever want in your whole life. And she, but by the time we got done, I knew more about her than I had found out talking with her in the interview. So some patients are absolutely terrific. And do your surgeons uh, put them in uh, Mayfield or just uh, no, lie in, their heads? No, they're in Mayfield. Mayfield? They're in, they're in pins. Um, uh, this, this has been a problem in a couple of patients. We had one patient who actually pulled out of the Mayfield uh, right. and got lacerations from the pins and was awake also. Now, what was interesting was she remembered nothing of pulling out of the pin. And they aborted the operation, put her back to sleep, got everything cleaned up, took her back a week later because she remembered, she was like, oh, I'm fine, nothing happened, what are you guys talking about? Uh, but she except was a witch. Gas on her head. Except for the big gash. You know? <coughs> so, uh, 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 yeah, there, there is this, this issue. Uh, there are these differences that you alluded to in, in excitability differences. I have not uh, appreciated it as a routine thing in our patients. Um, temporal language cortex is, takes a little bit higher stimulus than frontal language cortex to produce uh, things, but I, I really don't appreciate that. We, Maybe the way we do it, where we go up to 20 million amps, and then, uh, you know, we're working at that higher level. I think if we were down at six or five or six million amps, you know, we might say, "Oh yeah, this takes five million amps. This takes seven million amps." But we haven't really uh, appreciated that. If if the brain's a is a demitus, then you'll get changes. So as you as you, again, this is kind of obscured by the way we do it, but uh, if you're, um, um, you know, 20 milliamps, it really doesn't matter, but if you're working at 5 milliamps and you go from non edematous brain to edematous brain, you're going to have, here's a difference, so you got to put that in, factor that into your thinking. Um, motor responses, this is just direct. Uh, cortical stimulation, uh, you know, you, you've localized, uh, usually the way we do this for direct motor stimulation, the patient's asleep, so they're, if, if we're doing it in conjunction with speech mapping, then they put them back to sleep and we test them with the monopolar stimulation again on the, on the direct cortex. Uh, we, again, our friend, the compound muscle potentials, um, you can get broad muscle sampling, and again, we, we record the cortical EEG at the same time. We watch for after discharges, so we're always worried about after discharges. Um, this figure, I happen to drop the stimulus at the front end, but we tend to use the bursting train stimuli for doing direct cortical mapping rather than single pulses. Again, it, it makes a little more sense to me. I don't know. So it's a history, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm.